sing a very soon. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see the King. God is good. All the time. And all of the time. God is good. That's right. Thank you for being here. You know, in Texas, this is an exciting day. <laughs> you know, we, we don't expect much, but we get excited when it snows. So, it's supposed to today, but this is Texas. The sun could come out, and it could be 90 degrees this afternoon, because we live in Texas. But you know what the temperature is when you're in the house of the Lord? The temperature is hot. Because we love our Jesus here. We love our Jesus. We love serving him. We love going to church. We love all of that. Being a part of something bigger than ourselves. So if you haven't ever in internet land, if you have not ever been here before, please come check us out. Because we have a great, great church. And we're here this morning. We get to sing praises to our Jesus. And how much better can that be? So let's stand, and we are going to sing Worthy of Worship. He is so worthy of our worship. So let's stand, and let's sing with a joyful and a grateful heart. Worthy of worship. Worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all of the offerings we bring, you are worthy. Change in my life has been wrong. 
Lord, since Jesus came into my heart, I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, heart. floods of joy all my soul. about this grand old book. Are you ready? Say it with me. This is my Bible. It's God's holy word. It's given to teach me truth, to reprove me of sin, to correct me when I'm wrong and instruct me in what is right. It's a lamp unto my daily walk and a light unto my eternal path. And if I hide his words in my heart, then I will not sin against God. This is my Bible and it can change my life today. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Well, what a week. Amen. What a week. Woo! Have we seen God working this week or have we seen God working? Oh, I guess you didn't. I did. I, I, I mean, I saw him working all over the place. He was doing things so outside the box, it blew people's minds. Amen? I mean, literally blew their minds. Now, if you're a believer and you have your faith and trust in God, you can just sit back and smile and go, Wow! What in the world is God doing? I can't wait to see what's next. Amen? Come on! Man, I'll tell you what. The church has gone to sleep. Man, we've got the light. We've got everything. I'm preaching. I should stop. I'm going to get in my sermon. I better stop right there. We're going to, I just tell you, I'm excited about the sermon this morning. I'm excited about the possibility of snow. Amen? I'm an old Texas boy. You know, if it snows, it's exciting around here. Now, I know some of you guys from up north. I've been there. I lived there for three years. I, last year, I was there. The January, we never saw the ground for the snow. I couldn't wait to get out of there. But now I've been back in Texas for quite some time. So I look forward to a little bit of snow. I don't care about getting out and playing in it. I want to sit inside by the far and watch it do like this. That's all I want. I'll be happy as I can do if I can do that. Now, to, for that reason... 
I want to tell you that uh, they don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. And, uh, but it seems like that the possibility of snow is like 100%. And because we're Texans, I don't want to put anybody in danger, so we're going to stay home tonight, all right? We will not, we will not have... You saw Jane's driving video, didn't you? She was going to pick everybody up for church and slide us on in. Who was? Jane Adams. Oh, she was. <laughs> I didn't see it. I didn't see that. But anyway. Anyway, so we will not have church tonight, okay? I'm hoping that maybe about church time, I'll be sitting by my fire watching the snowflakes fall. Amen. That's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that I'll be able to do that. It, when I do this ahead of time like this, I, invariably what happens is there'll be a warm front blow in and it'll be 90 degrees by this afternoon and everybody will be going, that preacher just didn't have any faith in God, you know. <laughs> well, I do. I have faith in God and uh, I'm going to enjoy my afternoon watching it snow. I feel sure that it's going to happen. So anyway, so no church tonight, but we are having church this morning. Praise God. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> we have finished up the um, last week. We had our business fellowship and uh, you may have been voted into something if you weren't there on Sunday night right. so if you get a call from me telling you you need to be at a meeting nope. you need to be at the meeting amen so you you know you and you can't go well I didn't know I know you didn't but I'm telling you right now that if I call you and say be at the meeting you were chosen and you should have been at the meeting that's all I can tell you amen that's the way it works around here sometimes but uh, you're gonna have a good time uh, we've got uh, uh, nothing really going on this week, just some good old-fashioned church week, amen? Just finally get back to just being relaxed. Now, there are some things coming up. Uh, fish fry on the 21st, First. First, thank you. The 21st, Big Fish Fry, Brotherhood and uh, WM are putting that on. It's free to you. All we ask, if, if we're going to do any babysitting for you, if we're going to take any care, child care, that you bring $2 per child, that's all we ask. Everything else is taken care of. Everything else is taken care of. It's going to be good. And we invite you to come. It's a, it's a time for us to introduce you to what uh, the Brotherhood and WM are going to be doing uh, for Operation Christmas Child this year. So I hope that you'll uh, make plans to be here for that. And then February the 14th is a big day. I usually try to remind you guys of it a couple of weeks ahead of time so you don't get caught not taking care of it. But this year, I'm going to warn you a little ahead of time. On February the 14th, that's a Sunday. On Sunday night, instead of church, we're going to have a Valentine banquet. It's not just for couples. It's for everybody. Uh, couples, you can come and you can enjoy the time. But it's going to be for everybody. Everybody's going to be included in everything that we do. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think we're going to have a great time. I think it's going to be very inspirational as well as great food. So the cost, now there is a cost for that. Uh, first time ever, I've heard us charging you to come to church, but it's $10 per person. And that's for your meal and all the extras that we have planned for you. So I hope that you'll plan. And it is a, it is our first fundraiser towards Operation Christmas Child. So just to let you know, it will be a fundraiser for that. So $10 per person. And uh, if we're feeding you and take care of you, so make sure and do that, okay? But uh, get your tickets. Uh, you can call Jasmine, church office, or you can stop by, see her this morning. You might ask her if she's got them with her. Uh, but anyway, get your, get your ticket, $10 per person, okay? Don't forget that. That's for February 14th. There's no cost for child care that night. No, that's right. No cost for child care that night. Exactly. So that's good. All right. I think that's it. I think that's all. The choir started working on their Easter cantata stuff. But they won't be rehearsing until Wednesday night. And there's no snow predicted Wednesday night. Right. So we will have church Wednesday night. Amen. Yeah. All right, brother, come lead us in another song. Let's stand together and sing, How Great Thou Art.
How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art.
Amen. We serve a sovereign God. We, uh, <clears throat> last week, I uh, took a week off from Romans. First Sunday of the year, I normally do that and preach. Little did I know how God sovereignly chose for that to happen. Because the passage we deal with today speaks so much to everything that happened this week. And had I preached it last week, it wouldn't mean near as much as it's going to mean this morning. And I'm excited to be able to teach that to you. So take your Bibles out and go to Romans chapter 11, if you will. And let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, you are an awesome God. There is none like you. You control everything. You've made everything. You created everything. And God, we men, we think we know everything, but we don't. And I pray this morning, Father, you'll take us back into the scripture, back to see the Jews and how they responded to your message of grace. But then, Father, to bring us to today and how we need to hear this message for this hour. And I thank you, Father, for this opportunity. And just in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Paul, almost from the start of Romans, has been presenting a case of salvation by grace without the works, without the law. And a big part of his concern is directed towards the Jewish population who were struggling with the idea that the law could not save them. He has presented to us a numerous amount of arguments that would have been made by the Jews. They spoke of their ancestry, the fact that they were from Abraham's seed, and that was important, they thought. They had a special calling to be God's chosen people, which they did. They were the ones through whom the law was given, which they were. They had the covenants from Abraham and Moses and David, and they did. And they had been given the promised land. They pretty much had it all figured out. Amen. I mean, it looks like that's exactly it. Everything was going in the right direction for them to have their kingdom here on earth. It was going to happen. It looked like everything was going to be just like they thought. With each of these arguments, though, Paul would take them back to Scripture and prove his point that their salvation didn't lie in their calling or their ancestry or their land or their covenants. Their, their, their salvation would come only through Christ, not the law. So we now come to that last of the doctrinal part of this letter. Chapter 12, verse 1, Paul shifts to moving from doctrine to practical living. So we're in the very last portion of his doctrinal segment of this particular book. And the Jews were struggling with this idea of grace. And Paul has to draw this to a close because now he needs to move into the practical. And he knows that there are many of the Jews that still don't grasp the idea. They are struggling so hard with this idea of grace. Because so many of the Jews just could not accept God's choosing of the Gentiles as being part of the family of God. That just didn't make sense. How could that happen? And the Jews remained confused about God's promises. And how he would keep them if he was, in their eyes, turning his back on them. That's what it appeared. They'd been given his protection and gifts. Why would God want to open the door to the Gentiles to give them the same? And Paul gives one last argument. And it's relevant for us today. I start with the mystery. The blindness of Israel. How come they are missing? How come they can't understand? How come they just can't see how God is working, what God is doing? Why, why can't they see? They've got the scriptures. Why, did, why can't they understand where they are? Hmm. 
Verse 26. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So here's the point. The mystery is the blindness of Israel. They, admit, they, they haven't seen the proof from God's Word of the fact that God was going to include the Gentiles, although it's been there. But for some reason, they just kind of read over it. They just kind of missed it. The mystery is described for us in Ephesians chapter 3. Listen to this, verse 2 through 6. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, Paul talking to the Gentiles, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, which is other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto this holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That the, here's the, the mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Paul said, here's the mystery. You're missing it. Here was the mystery all the way through the Old Testament. God was going to do this. God was going to open the door and he was going to bring the Gentiles in and they were going to be a part of the family of God just like you are. And they're scratching their heads and they're going, we, we, we didn't see that. Where, 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 where? And Paul over and over again has opened the scriptures to them and told them from the word of God how that they were blinded by this. They just couldn't see it. And their blindness was exposed in the Old Testament. Listen to this, Isaiah 44, 18. These were the scriptures they had and they studied and they read. Listen to what it says. They have not known nor understood. For he has shut their eyes that they cannot see and their hearts that they cannot understand. Paul, God told them through the prophet Isaiah, this was exactly what was going to happen. And it has. In Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, The word of the Lord also came unto me, saying, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Ezekiel was talking about Judah and about how that they had turned their backs, or Israel, as they turned their backs on God. They weren't listening. God was speaking, but they weren't listening. God was telling them, but they weren't listening. They couldn't see it. Although God was telling them. In the New Testament, Paul says, and this was an eye-opening passage to me, 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 16. It says, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. As if there was a veil. They would read the Old Testament. They'd read through those verses, but there was a veil that blinded their eyes. They just couldn't grasp hold of the truth of what was there. And he goes on to say, he says... Uh, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Amen. Now, you've got to get this because this is, this is important to where I'm going with this, this passage. This is important to where this message is going to go. They were blinded until they got their eyes on the Lord. They just couldn't see because their eyes were drifted away from the things of God and they were watching out for all the other things. They were more concerned about themselves than they were about what God was doing. And so they were blind to what was going on around them. But listen to what verse 26 and 27 of our text says. Paul says, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Paul says, look, you guys, I'm telling you, you don't see it. But if you would recognize what God is doing, if you put your eyes on Jesus, if you would recognize that Jesus Christ has everything that you need in salvation and forget about all this other stuff you've been trying to, to live on, you would begin to see that God's going to bring about salvation to all of Israel. Now, I know this, that Paul's referring to a time that's coming. God gives a new covenant to Israel. Let me read it to you. It's out of Jeremiah 31. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Now, every covenant that he's made with the house of Israel to this point, the Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, all these covenants that he's made, every one of them has been dependent upon on God doing what he's going to do as Israel does what they're supposed to do. Do you realize that those covenants are broken. Not because God wasn't going to do what he was going to do. It's because man couldn't live up to those covenants. 
We can't live up to the law. We can't live up to the coach. God says, if you'll do this, I'll do this. And man says, okay, I'll do that. But we don't. It's the same thing as salvation. Many say, well, I, I know what I've got to do to be saved. I've got to be good. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to go to church. I've got to give. I've got to do And God says, no, that's not what I said. If you will believe on me, I'll give you salvation. That's the promise. That's the covenant. But you want to make it about you. You want to make it about what you can do. See, the covenant was with God, and God was always true. Well, God's going to give a new covenant to Israel here, and I want to read it to you. And this covenant's not dependent upon man. It's not dependent on what you do. Listen to this. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That's not talking about anything going on today. I wouldn't be preaching if that were the case, because I wouldn't need to if everybody knew the Lord. But they don't know the Lord. This is referring to a time when God will establish His kingdom on earth. This is at the second coming. And there will be a remnant of those who are living through the tribulation that will come into that time. And God will, they will have been saved. They will have God in their heart. The Lord Jesus will have forgiven their sins. And they will enter into a kingdom here on earth. Everyone being saved. No one that's lost will go into that kingdom. Only the saved. Wow. That's coming. You know why it's going to happen? Because God said so. Amen. It's not dependent upon us. It's not dependent upon them. It's, not dependent. it's just dependent upon God. God said He was going to do it. Amen. That's the sovereignty of God, isn't it? Amen. And I want you to listen as I make this case about Israel's confusion and loss of trust because they did not understand what God was doing because it will apply to what I'm going to say to you as a Christian in just a moment. So let's look. So we understand that there's a new covenant. Now then, in verse 28, Paul says this, looking as from the Gentiles, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Sitting here as a Gentile, I see the Jews, and they were, they were attacking the Gentiles. They were attacking everything the Gentiles believed. They were trying to throw them in prison. Paul was in part, in part, part of that. And uh, they were trying to. But, but Paul says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. They become your enemies so you can be saved. Basically what he's saying. And then from the Jewish side, or from God's side actually, he says, but as touching the election, they are beloved of the Father's sake. And there he's referring to Israel. He said they're beloved of God. God hasn't stopped loving them. God hasn't said that they're not his people. God hasn't disowned them in any way. They're still the chosen. They're still the elect. But what has happened? They've turned their backs on God. And they're gifted, verse 29, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He says, those gifts and calling. Jeff, as you walk by that, would you turn that one down? It's, I'm heated up up here. Thank you. I just happened to catch him. But when it comes to the Gentiles, he says, uh, I'm sorry, the gifts that God had given the Jews, he said, I'm not taking those away. I'm not taking the promised land away from them. He's never going to do that. That's theirs. It is forever theirs. It will be theirs. It doesn't matter what happens in our world political system. That Israel is theirs. They can run them out of there. It's still theirs. Because God has given that to them. And you can't, you can't, you can't delete God's promises. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> that is a woo moment, isn't it? Woo! Yeah. That is good. You can't delete the promises of God. This is a promise that he made. And those promises and the, the gifts that he's given them. He said they're not, they're not done away. They're not without repentance. They haven't been turned back. And then notice this. The Gentiles' belief is through the Jews' unbelief. Verse 30. For as you in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. He's talking to the Gentiles. For as you in times past had not believed God, that was the Gentiles. They didn't even think about God. They were busy doing their own thing. But when God came and began to deliver the message to them through Paul and the other apostles, all of a sudden they're being saved and they found mercy through the fact of the Jews' unbelief. Remember? Now watch this. 
The Jews' belief is found in the mercy of the Gentiles. Verse 31, even so have these also now not believed, the Jews, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. So basically he said this, you're a Jew and you're a Gentile, and I just want to tell you that from the Gentile side, you need to understand you're saved because they, they stopped believing. And so God has given you salvation. He planned to do that, by the way. But God's given you salvation, and it's based upon the fact that they're unbelief. Oh, by the way, your unbelief, you can find mercy through their mercy because they're not going to, it's not just for them. It's for you as well. In fact, he clears that up in the next verse. It says, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. There's the big picture. You see, as a Gentile, I can sit back and say, Man, look at everything God's given me as a Gentile. And just think about how blessed I am that God's given me salvation. He's given me everything, you know, all these promises. He's given me the Word of God. He's given me the New Testament. He's given me the apostles. He's given me the prophets. He's given me all these things to me. Man, I tell you what, I'm really special. I'm glad I'm not one of those Jews. And the Jews can sit over there and say, man, I'm glad I'm not one of those Gentiles. Because I'm, I'm, I'm the original, you know. I'm the original child of God. I'm the original person of God. I've been given the law. I've been given the promise. And I've been given all these things. And they can sit over there and say, look at me. I've really got it all together. And God says, you guys are missing the boat. I'm for both of you. I want both of you to find mercy. I want both of you to be saved. I want all of you to be saved. Now... You can only imagine the confusion this brought to the Israelites. They thought they had God all figured out. It was all quite simple. God had chosen them and everyone else could just suck on a lemon. Uh, basically, you know, we're chosen of God. We're the Jews. We're Abraham's seed. We've been given the law. We've been given the promised land. Hey, psh, go suck a lemon. You're not included. They thought they had God figured out. That's where the problem lies when Jesus comes and he changes the rules, so to speak. Not, by, not, well, he changes the rules in the fact that he includes the Gentiles by faith. He brings that faith thing in. The Jews had learned that they didn't need faith because they had the law. As long as we obey the law, we'll be okay. Problem was they couldn't obey the law. So Paul closes this with a remarkable truth about God for all of us when we're faced with the problem of understanding God's plan. All of this that I've just taught you relates to what we see today. We've got, one, we've got our eyes on the wrong things. We have, we have, we have, mm, mm, mm. I wish I could tell you this past week how many times I've had to counsel people and share with people and try to pull them back down to earth. They have lost their ever-loving minds over a political process of the United States, over a pandemic that's over the world, and they forgot that this is all about God. And let me tell you something about my God. He's mine. Woo! He's my God. Is He your God? Amen. If He is, why don't you live like that? Why don't we examine the things that we've gotten so upset about this last week and let's put them in context with what we believe about God. Let's just stop for a minute. Let's realize some things. That God is still in charge. Amen. You see, the problem is we all thought we had Him all figured out. Whether Democrat or Republican, we all thought, oh, we got it all figured out. This is the way it's got to go. It's got to go my way. It's got to go my way. No, it's my way. If we don't go my way, the world's going to be lost. I mean, America's going to be lost. America's going to be this. America's going to be that. Hey, listen. God's so much bigger than America. Amen. And I love America. Please don't get me wrong. But my God's so much bigger than what this process is going on here. Amen. The idea. Oh, my goodness. We're going to hell in a handbasket if this happens. I'm not going to hell. Period. So you can forget that topic. That's not going to happen. I'm going to keep my eyes on the master. Amen. Amen. Now listen to what Paul says. All right, look at the next verse. How powerful. <laughs> verse 33, he's unsearchable. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God. Exclamation point. 
Paul is excited. God said, I mean, Paul said, you Jews, you, you've missed the boat and you're not understanding because you've got your eyes on the wrong thing. And I can say the same thing about the Gentiles. You've gotten prideful. You need to stop this. And I can tell you today as the preacher, listen, if you think it's about being a Democrat or a Republican, you've lost your mind. We serve a God that's so much bigger than politics. Amen? So much bigger than the politics of our country. Oh my goodness. He goes on, he says, How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. In his wisdom, he's unsearchable. His wisdom so far surpasses our wisdom that it says in the Bible that our wisdom is pure foolishness in comparison. Oh, we think we know so much. Our politicians, they think they know this and they know that. And boy, they can spout this and they can spout that. Listen, they ain't even begun to touch the wisdom that God has. He's unsearchable in his judgments and his decisions. What he decides to do, he's right in doing it. Amen? You know why? He's God. I don't care who's the president of the United States. You know why? Because my God's still God. My president will change every four to eight years. That's going to happen. But my God never gets off the throne. Amen. Woo! Amen. Are you hearing what I'm telling you this morning? Amen. He's past, he's unsearchable in his ways and the things he does. Listen to Job. You know, Job is a prehistoric man, basically. He lived before the flood. He lived back. He's the, that's the oldest book in the Bible right here. Listen to what Job says, what he found out. Can, in Job 11, 7 through 10. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Can you find out everything there is to know about Him? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? It's deeper than hell. What canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth, broader than the sea. If He cut off and shut up and gather together, then who can hinder Him? If God has control over all the atmosphere, if God has the if God has the ability to make it snow in Texas this afternoon, I tell you what I'm saying. There's nothing that can hinder God. If God wanted to, He could freeze the ocean. He'd have no problem with that. He'd have absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. I love somebody put on Facebook. Who was it? Uh, they show, I think it was Hake. Uh, he put on. They showed the sun. And then he showed the relationship of the size of each planet to the sun. And then he talked about the biggest star is bigger, almost as big as our solar system in diameter. And my, my only thought was, and I worry about who's the president of the United States. When my God can speak that into existence. When my God can just speak and, and nothing becomes this beautiful universe that we have. And we, we think we know everything about God. We don't even know everything about our universe. We haven't been to the furthest star yet. Uh, let me just say this. We haven't been to the deepest depths of the earth yet. We haven't even explored this planet to its extent yet. And yet we think we know everything about the one who created it. What's wrong with us? Verse 34. He's beyond understanding. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Oh, I know a lot of people want to counsel the Lord. I've even done that on occasion or two. Lord, I need to talk to you about this. Lord, I, I don't like what's going on. Lord, I think you need to change things. God, I think something's not right here. Who am I to counsel God? But we really think we can. We really think we have that kind of knowledge and ability to counsel God in the things He has planned, the things He's doing. Listen to Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I'm stuck to this old ball. You know that? Now I can get on an airplane and I can fly 30,000 feet in the air. But you know, his thoughts go far beyond any th to the comparison of how far I can go. It, it, it's unbelievable how much he's so far above us. Do we really think that we can understand 
that we can counsel this God? To give him instruction on how to be a better God? <laughs> and you know it's true. We do that, don't we? We think, God, you know, if I were you, this would really work out better if you just do this. And God chuckles like a father would a son that you're trying to teach to drive. And he said, I think ours for race, dead. Right. <laughs> you got it all figured out, son. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, didn't work. We, we need to really understand who we are in this picture. And then verse 35, he's provided all things. Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. There was the thought I had. Do, you, do we have something that God needs in order to be God? Is there anything that you have or I have that God needs from me or you to make him God? Is there anything at all? No. But I sure need a lot of him. Amen. Amen. Is God lacking anything that we as humans can provide? No. The truth is that we receive everything from Him. That breath you just took. You know you got that from God. You didn't even think about it, but you did. Your heart just beat. Did you hear that? God gave you that. You had no business dealing with that. That's God's. We have so, we have so elevated the idea of man that we've forgotten how big God is. What a shame. Truth is, we cannot outgive God. You just can't outgive God. Go ahead and try it. I was reading, there was a, a man from Longview, his name is R.G. Letourneau. I don't know if you're familiar with him, if you've ever heard of Letourneau University. It's in Longview. And he was a, uh, he was a businessman. He was an inventor. In fact, some of the largest earth moving equipment that's ever been built was built by Letourneau. And, um, but let me just tell you about him. This man loved God. He decided early on in his life that he would try to outgive God. So he started out by giving the 10% because that's what every preacher said he was supposed to give. So he started giving 10%. But then you got to think, well, wait a minute. God gives me a lot more than 10%. I need to give more. So he started increasing his giving. And he finally increased it. By the time he died, he was giving 90% of his income. He was a millionaire. He was giving 90% of his income away to the Lord. And he would tell you, you cannot outgive God. Go ahead and try. You just can't do it. God's an amazing God. He gives. And then lastly, he's indescribable. Look at verse 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. For of him, through him, and to him are all things. That's the God we serve. That's the God of this church. That's the God who sits upon the throne of all eternity. Not just heaven and earth, but all eternity. And he will never be dethroned. Satan thought he would try. And where'd he wind up? Hail. Hail. Man keeps trying to think that he has something that he knows that God doesn't know, but he doesn't. That's the reason people go to hell, because they think they know more than God. God says, here it is. I will buy for you salvation. I will give it to you. My son will die for you. He will go to the cross. He will be raised the third day. And he will offer you salvation. All you have to do is take it. And they go, uh-uh, wait. That's too easy. I don't want it. I, I, I got to work for it. God says, you can't. But in their pride, in their indifference... In their God mentality, they think they can outfigure God. You can't. He's God alone. He's God alone. And He's the creator of all things. And He will receive glory forever and ever. No one or nothing can prevent that from happening. Nothing. Nothing. Not an invasion on the Capitol. Not changing of presidents. Not change in civilization as we know it. It will not change who God is and what he can do. Let's keep our eyes on the one who's in charge. Amen. And quit letting the world tell us they're in charge.
They're not. God's in charge. God's in charge. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you this morning for this message. We needed it. I needed it. Lord, I want to be a, I want to be a, a, a heralder of the truth that you are God. I want my life to demonstrate to others that I serve a God that's above the situations of this world. I refuse to let the world dictate to me how I'm supposed to feel. I want to love you. I want to keep my eyes on you. I want to be in touch with you, the God of this universe, my Father, the one who I can pray to. And the minute I speak, you're already involved in answering the prayers. And it's not that you can't answer them because you can. You can do abundantly above all that we could ever think or ask. Your thoughts are so far above ours, your ways. Father, forgive us as humans, your creation, that sometimes we think we're God. Let us, Father, today humbly submit to you that we love you and we trust you. And by faith, we accept whatever it is you bring into our life. Because you're God and we're not. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder this morning. Have you been trying to be God of your life? Have you been thinking, you know what, I, I can figure this out. I can get to heaven on my own. I don't need God's help. I can make it. I, I can do enough good things. I can do this. I don't need God. If you are, can I challenge you this morning? Would you just stop and realize how futile that is? Would you understand that God is so much bigger than you are? And God is holy and he's perfect and he's just. And he has, he has provided you a way of salvation that's been bought for you with the price of Jesus Christ who died for you. And God wants you to have this eternal life. He wants you to walk with Him, talk with Him. He wants to have a relationship with you. The God of the universe, the creator of everything. He wants to have a relationship with you. Why won't you come? Why won't you give your heart and life to Him today? If you're lost this morning, you don't know Christ as your Savior. You've never made that decision. Can I challenge you today? Would you make that decision for the Lord? Right there where you are, just, just pray and say, Lord, I know I've been trying to get to heaven on my own, but I'm failing. I need your help. I can't get there by myself. I need you. I need your salvation. I yield my sin. I give up. I want to put my faith and trust in you and what you've done for me. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. Fill me with your spirit. And allow me, Father, to walk in that relationship as a son of God. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all your heart, I hope that you'll let me know. Tell somebody. Tell somebody that you received Christ today. Oh, how God will be honored by that. A dear child of God, listen and listen carefully. If you have allowed the world situation this week to confuse you, upset you, discourage you get your eyes back on God stop letting the circumstances of this world that will one day be burned up stop letting that influence your relationship with God make him number one talk about him share him forget the politics of the world Start talking about Jesus. Start talking about God. He's so much bigger than the politics of this world. Let's be men and women of God. And let's promote our Lord. Let's glorify Him with our lives. Father, I thank you again for this morning. I pray, Father, you might take and use this message. May it be an encouragement to many. May many, Father, decide today, no more will I let the world dictate to me how I'm supposed to feel. We thank you, Lord, that we serve a omnipotent, omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Don't forget, no church tonight. No church tonight. Stay home. Watch the snow. If there's no snow, then close your eyes and imagine there's snow. All right. We love you guys. Talk to you later.